So, Father, we come. Thank you that you loved us, that you had mercy upon us, that you uh, saw us when we were unlovely and chose us for yourself. And so we pray that we could extend that same grace to others. Inspire us today by your scripture, by your spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the, there's a verse in Jeremiah 9.24, actually we'll start in 9.23, which has been uh, coming this week. It says, Let not the wise man, thus says the Lord, Jeremiah 9.23, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Things that people brag about in this world. He says, don't brag about that stuff. But let him boast, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. And what are the things that he wants us to know about him? That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. We want to know Him. First thing He says, I'm a God that practices steadfast love, loving kindness, uh, unfailing love, or what other translation says. It's a, a strengthened form of, of mercy, love, that we will look at today. Psalm 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. People view sometimes God as the, the uh, iron-fisted judge in the sky, just hoping to clobber us when we go wrong. Uh, but the, if you know God, he says, boast in this, that you know me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love. And they, there is the justice and the righteousness, which are things that he equally delights in, but they're... He's not an imbalance. The word steadfast love, loving kindness, the Hebrew word is uh, hesed or chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D or H-E-S-D. It occurs 248 times in the King James manuscript of the Bible. Uh, you may recall that when Moses said, Lord, show me your glory, that God didn't show him the the wonders of the ocean depths or the planets out there, but he just passed before them and proclaimed his character. He said in Exodus 34, 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. If God was to, you know, if we said, Lord, show us your glory, and he was to, to just walk into this room in some way that, that we could understand. And I believe that he'd be saying today, I am the Lord, the God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And then the next verse, he goes on to talk about the fact that the, 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 the tragedy of sin and how that impacts still that he, uh, I received a gift for Christmas uh, of earbuds for my phone. So I listened through uh, all of Isaiah and Jeremiah this week. And uh, it's uplifting, it's encouraging. There's so many warnings there. But he keeps saying, I was hoping that they would respond so that I could forgive them, so I could have compassion upon them. In, the, uh, in Second Chronicles, the dedication of the temple, 2 Chronicles 5.13, And it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison in praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals, other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, uh, for He is good, His steadfast love, loving kindness, His mercy endures forever. When they said that and sang that, the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. There is Psalm 136, 26 verses that say uh, there's a proclamation about the love, the, the Lord, and it says, for his steadfast love endures forever. They would repeat that. They would let it reverberate there in, in the sanctuary where they were. 
in a couple of chapters later, 2 Chronicles 7, 3, it says, When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. It's not some trivial side issue here, but this is central to who God is and who he wants us to be. We're going to sing of the goodness of the Lord at the close of the message today, but uh, uh, I pray that the glory of the Lord will fill our hearts and our minds as we as we see him. And over in Ephesians, I don't have it up there, but, but Paul prayed for the people that they could see how wide and long and deep and high to know the love of God which passes knowledge so that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. Until you catch a glimpse of his love, you're not going to be filled with all the fullness of God. You're not going to be able to share it with the other people around about you that don't deserve it either. The first occurrence of this word is found in Genesis 19. It's the story of Lot who had pitched his tent toward Sodom, took the good land when Abraham gave him the choice of where he would go and he headed down towards the Fertile Plains, towards the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea, probably before it was dead, but it was great land. And uh, But because of the wickedness that was in that city, God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire. But in his loving kindness, he said, there's some there, there's a family there that I'm going to rescue. And he sent his angels, Genesis 19, 15, as morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. And you have shown me great kindness, loving kindness there is the word we're talking about, the same Hebrew word. Uh, you have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot escape to the hills lest the disaster overtake me and I die. And God made provision for him in a, a smaller town nearby. But uh, God, in his loving kindness and mercy, he remembered Lot, who had uh, chosen the, uh, for his own benefit at the expense of Abraham. Fortunately, God's bigger than Lot. And he told Abraham, this whole land here I'm going to give to you. Lot got what he chose and ended up with nothing other than his life and two daughters. Uh, but God, in his loving kindness, didn't just say, Oh, Lot's this selfish guy, I'm just going to let him perish along with everybody else. He sent angels, and in his steadfast love, he said, Come out. And when they weren't going fast enough, he grabbed them by the hand and said, you got to go. <laughs> Have you ever had God grab you by the hand and say, Let's, let's get out of here. I'm going to rescue you from a situation that's not good for you. One of the next times, uh, five chapters later, uh, in Genesis 24, Abraham wanted his son Isaac to have a bride, and so he sent Eliezer, the servant, on ahead back to the homeland where Abraham had come from, and this was the prayer of Eliezer, the servant. He said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, Please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. If you're a single person hoping for marriage today, hope in the steadfast love of the Lord, <laughs> not just your own resources. God sent him to providentially to a woman in, in the well there, Genesis 24, 14. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one that you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love 
to my master. And God has shown steadfast love to me and to my mother when I met Yvonne. <laughs> in answer to her prayers, some of you know that story. Uh, but uh, the steadfast love, it, it affects every area of our lives. And we, if we know God, we don't have to worry that he doesn't want the best for me, that he's... Uh, you know, finding fault with me is not going to bless me because there's imperfections in my heart and my life. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. That's what we need to focus on as we, as we try to do the best we can in, in learning to obey and walk in the ways of the Lord. But uh, steadfast love is something that doesn't depend on me being good and perfect. Depends on God being good and perfect. Uh, then, in a, a couple of verses later there, well, verse 27, Eliezer said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and faithfulness toward my, my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. It wasn't by coincidence but Eliezer ended up at the household there that uh, where they had the people that they knew and were related to. It was the steadfast love. It's God's steadfast love that guides you in your occupation, in your, in your career and calling and ministry and everything else. Verse 49, uh, he asked them to show some steadfast love to him. As he was saying, you know, I want to take your darling daughter, Rebecca, away. Probably never going to see her again. Uh, but now, if you're going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. If not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. He said, I, uh, I've asked you something here, which is huge. Stealing Rebecca away from you. I'm going to take her, uh, and she's going to be the bride of Isaac, a guy that she had never met, and they knew of perhaps through family uh, stories that had been told across the across the desert. There, I don't know, but uh, but uh, he said, "Would you show me steadfast love by allowing me to take your daughter?" Steadfast love is something that goes beyond the boundaries of what is normal. Many times, it's something that's extraordinary, and uh, you know, you may know the rest of the story. They, said, well, we'll have to ask her. And she said, yes, I will go with this man. And then they said, well, wait, you know, let's keep you here for a few days. She said, no, I'm going now. <laughs> I want to meet Isaac. I want to meet Abraham. I want to start a family. I want to, she didn't know that she was going to become the, the mother in Israel, of, uh, that uh, she would be a, a predecessor of all the tribes of Israel and everything else and the honor that would come to her, but uh, she was willing. She would have stayed around, maybe she would have changed her mind. When God tells you to do something, you better do it without starting to, yeah. to think about other things. But just get in and do it. Psalm 23, verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There needs to be, if you know God, you know that he is a God that delights in loving kindness, and that's the word that's used here, I believe, for mercy. Goodness and, and loving kindness. Uh, steadfast love shall follow me all the days of my life. When you have that concept, you don't have to go through life worrying about every decision you make, worrying about every circumstance that comes into your life. There will be difficult times, no doubt, and there surely were for Rebecca. In that story, that God's mercy is following all the days of your life. The word there is, is not just you're dragging along behind you like some bird. It's chasing you. It's pursuing you. God's steadfast love are pursuing you. God's steadfast love pursued Joseph when he got sold by his brothers into Egypt. It says in Genesis 39, 21, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. God's 
steadfast love doesn't depart from us every time a difficult circumstance arises. God had a purpose in that difficult circumstance, both Joseph's character development and also for the, the, the nation of Israel that was consisted of Joseph's brothers and their families and their dad Jacob at that time. He wanted to preserve them. And God's goodness followed Joseph right down to the prison that he was in in, in Egypt and uh, raised him up out of that. In 2 Samuel chapter 9, we have the story of Mephibosheth. He was the grandson of Saul. And ordinarily, when one king rises to power, he eliminates the descendants of the previous king to make sure they don't try and rise up and claim the throne and gather people around them. But uh, David didn't do that to the house of Saul. 2 Samuel 9, 3, the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. And David said to him, He called him and had him come. And of course, Mephibosheth was thinking, It's over. This is the end for me. But David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jacob, and I will restore you to all the land of Saul your father. You shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Many times I felt like that. When God's grace has just crumpled me instead of punishing me, he seems to just pour out his grace and his mercy and his love and his provision. And I think, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? was well, because we have a God that delights in loving kindness. A God that, that uh, cares about us. And here we see that it wasn't just a one-time deal, but David invited Mephibosheth to come and eat at his table every day. Come and share with me. I want to bless you. Instead of uh, uh, exterminating you, I want to bless you. Beyond the bounds of expectation, I, I spoke a message a couple of years ago, crumpled by grace, how God works in our lives. And the illustrations that Les Miserables, uh, the, the story in which the thief was given, instead of being punished for taking the silverware, he was given the, gold, the silver candlesticks when the police brought him back. Please take these. It did a change. There's something is so much more motivating about receiving grace and love than just receiving fear. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Uh, and uh, we understand that. Boast that you know the God who is bound in loving kindness, in mercy and steadfast love. And that doesn't diminish his justice and his righteousness. But you're going to have so much of a higher higher octane fuel to live in righteousness and justice when you're doing it because you know that you are loved. And I'm fearful of getting clobbered over the head. David knew something about that himself in Psalm 51. After he had uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed, it says in, in verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast love. David knew about the steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Do you need God's abundant mercy today? you need him to blot out your transgressions? Well, then pray David's prayer. Have mercy. Not according to how good I have been how hard I have tried to overcome these things, or how much I regret it. According to one thing, your steadfast love, that's all that I'm relying upon today. Blot out my transgressions. When Jesus came to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders that were so down on the, the sinful people that Jesus was going to their houses, Jesus was reaching out to them embracing them. Uh, he he uh, illustrated this. Matthew 9.10 
And Jesus reclined at table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The Pharisees were the type of magnets that were the poles repulse each other. People saw a Pharisee come and they'd head to the other side of the street. But when Jesus came, it was like the magnet that drew them unto him. And he quoted this verse from the Old Testament. I, uh, he, Jesus knew the Father as no one else ever has. He says, this is why I'm doing this, because the Father cares about those people. He's a God of steadfast love and loving kindness. He cares about the, the woman taken in adultery. He cares about the tax collectors. He cares about the fishermen and everybody else that the world may look down upon. But learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And the word mercy in Greek there, going back to the Old Testament, is the same word he said. The loving kindness, the steadfast love, that's what God desires. He would rather have mercy on us than punish us. That's what the cross is about. <laughs> he would rather send his own son to the cross for our sins than punish us in hell forever because he is a God abounding in, in steadfast love. Loving kindness, he wants us to be able to respond. Micah 7 and verse 18 says, Who is a God like you? Pardoning, well, first I should read Micah 6 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness? The word kindness there is has said, steadfast love, a love that that's, uh, pays allegiance to, to loyalty to people who keeps loving them even when they are unlovely. To love kindness, God requires those three things. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. That's the law well, and the commandments boiled down to three. Jesus boiled it down to two. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But that is, uh, that's what God requires of us. He requires of us. When you think of, of circumstances in your life when somebody has done you dirt and you have turned around and done good to them and seen the response in their lives, I mean, I'll give you, if anybody has ever done that, and you would like to share with us so that we can be encouraged, I'm going to give you a, an opportunity right now. Anybody that's ever done anything good to somebody that did bad to you, Well, maybe next week. <laughs> we were talking about this, this verse from Jeremiah in, in our Zoom prayer meeting this week, and I mentioned a particular person who, within the last month, has cussed me out and seems to have no use for me. And my natural reaction would be uh, to ignore them at best or uh, think ill of them. At worst, uh, instead, I took a, my Christmas letter to that person and said, Merry Christmas. How are you doing? <laughs> I will tell you one story I'm thinking about when we first moved into to, uh, our home there in Terrace Heights. Uh, There's an alley below us, a lady that lived there that lived there longer than we had, and uh, there used to be a mail turnaround in the alley. It was abandoned, and so it was just a big area which uh, she claimed for her own. It belonged to the whole the county, actually. But I was cutting up firewood one night at a big elm tree at the place I was working as a custodian. I cut it, cut down some, or cut some trees up, and I got in late one night after dark, dumped a load in the alley on her place. <laughs> And she uh, came over the next morning, saw it, and read me the riot act. And I 
thought of explaining to her the legality of what I had done, that she didn't own that and all, but I just said, I'm sorry. Threw it over the fence. That was probably in September or October. December came, I went knocking on her door with a big plate of goodies. And she first saw me kind of look in her eye like, oh. But uh, the next day or two, there was a bigger plate at my house. <laughs> and we became friends. I helped her many times. Yvonne and I often prayed for that house that we could purchase it, thinking that Dad and Mom could perhaps move in there someday. Uh, but she, I helped her with projects, uh, helped her re-roof it at one point. Some guys were not doing a too good job, so I went up there and helped them. I was thinking, you know, this might be my house someday. <laughs> I better do it right. Uh, but uh, Sharon became such a friend, and ended up moving uh, away. And there's more to that story, Buffy the cat and all that. And some of you read my Christmas letter a few years ago or know something about that. but. Uh, she sold it to my son David in a steadfast love of the Lord that he was able to purchase that when he was just quitting his job and starting at Perry Tech and all. But she, she, not, she had been offered cash for that house. She said, if you folks will buy it, I'm going to knock 25000 off of that. And she did. The, the steadfast love of the Lord. I showed steadfast love towards Sharon. She became a dear friend. I drove her and her sister down to, or we flew down to Texas to help her get settled in there at one point. And uh, they still stopped by. But, I, you know, it's so much better to show steadfast love than to show revenge and hatred and coming out with self. Uh, and it's because who is a God like you? In Micah 7, 18. Not doesn't say who is a God like you, the, the God of creation and wonders and science and all that. It says who is a God like you. There is no other God of any world religion that compares with our God. Because the word grace, steadfast love, compassion, forgiveness. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. God delights when we go beyond the boundaries of what, what might be our normal reactions or the world's normal reaction, because he goes beyond the boundaries. He looks beyond our fault, he sees our need, and he invites us to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God.